right. So Pat, we've been talking about sort of this new shape of the food system um, where companies are really adjusting to the new technological landscape um, in lots of different ways all along the food chain and in how sort of the behind the scenes managers of investors and, and how big data is really changing a lot of these different industries. Um, I think it's a great time to to begin exploring some ideas of how what we can do about this and what are some ways forward for those of us who know that the way that we're heading isn't necessarily going to benefit people or, or farmers or people who enjoy eating eating food. <laughs> um, how can we tackle competition policy, for example? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got lots and lots of reasons to be optimistic. And, and I'm, I know that that probably sounds almost absurd in light of, of our conversations we've had so far. But I think we have to remember that we are at a point where the whole food chain is rattled. The whole food chain is shaken up and nervous and not quite sure where it's going to go. It's not sure whether it's converging or it's uh, solidifying in some horrible way. It, it doesn't itself trust where its future is. You've got big sectors of the food chain, the fertilizer companies I mentioned, uh, not knowing if they've got a future. You've got the big, huge grain trading companies also alarmed by their situation and not sure. You've got, for the first time ever, the pro processing companies and the retailers who felt like they were the top dogs in the chain, uh, not at all confident of what their future is going to look like. So everyone's a bit scared, and that means there's opportunity. It means that uh, we've got uh, the possibility of playing some parts of the chain against other parts of the chain. We've got the possibility of talking now to policymakers, including the regulators who deal with uh, competition policy and so on, uh, about these issues in ways that they wouldn't have actually even thought about before. The experience with uh, all the mergers at the beginning of the food chain and other mergers that have taken place in communications technologies and pharmaceuticals and so on have really shocked the entire sort of antitrust regulatory regime around the world in each of its national offices. They know they don't have the tools they need to control this. They know more is coming. They know it's being driven by new technologies. They don't even begin to understand themselves. And they know that it's not a safe time for societies in a world where no one is very convinced that they've got a good shot at food security in the year 2050 or 2100 with climate change and everything else. So the companies themselves are confused and uncertain and fighting with each other. That's always good. The regulators uh, and policymakers are confused and uncertain and know that they've got a problem. They're being told, by the way, by all of the academics, whether the left-wing academics and the right-wing academics, the economists, um, are all saying that it's gone too far, that there's um, too much concentration. And they're all saying that this much concentration in the food system means that there's going to be less innovation in the food system when we need it most in terms of all these new pressures on, on climate and so on. So all of that nervousness from all quarters means that, that there's room for civil society to step in and clarify the scene, what's really happening here, folks, and to point to ways ahead. And one of the ways ahead is, as you mentioned, Trudy, is... is the possibility for us to say we need to have, let's say, a United Nations Treaty on Competition Policy. It, it's uh, almost astonishing that we don't have one. We have the World Trade Organization. Um, no one loves it very much. Actually, no one loves it anymore, but it's there. And when the WTO was trying to negotiate uh, its, its structure in, in, in the early 1990s, 1995, the issue of competition policy came up. And logic would suggest that if you're going to have policies on tariffs and everything else, kind of, then why wouldn't you have an international agreement on competition and how you would decide on mergers and acquisitions? Well, governments couldn't agree to that. The South, entirely understandably, didn't trust the North to try to set the deal on, on how the competition policy would be managed. The North didn't want to share that decision-making with the South because in 1995, almost all of the mergers and acquisitions were taking place in the North among, among key countries. They didn't want to have to share the, the policy-making or discussion with the South at all. So in the end, competition policy is a national decision with no international rules. Now, that, again, still isn't making anybody very happy. It still means that today, when a buyer wants to buy Monsanto, they've got to go to at least 30 different countries to get approval. And they could find themselves in a difficult situation. It's long, it's complicated, it's expensive, and the outcome isn't guaranteed. 
So they don't like it either. And you know, their, their sense of insecurity there uh, means that they would also like to see a different system in place. Uh, the, for the South, what's shifted since 1995 in the creation of the WTO is that now more and more of the big mergers and acquisitions are taking place in the South. They involve China, they involve Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, India are all players in this. So, so the, 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 the burden of, of, um, of uh, investment and interest is, is shifting. Not only is, is the, are the big players shifting a bit, but even more importantly, the market is shifting. If you want to figure out where the power is in the pesticide industry, it's with the countries that are buying the pesticides. It's like the major markets for the pesticides. Where are the major markets for pesticides? They're, they're frankly in uh, Brazil and Argentina, in India and in China. Uh, those four countries together make up one third of the global pesticide market. If two of those companies, uh, let's say Brazil and, and um, Argentina even, had together said, we don't want Bayer and Monsanto to merge or Dow and DuPont to merge, they would not have merged. Not because regulators in Washington or Brussels said no. They would have not merged because their shareholders would have said no. They would have said, no, 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 uh, we can't make any money on this deal. Our share value will go down if we can't work in the markets of Argentina and, uh, and Brazil. So the power has shifted from the north to the south. So today it's possible to go to the UN and say, folks, we need to have a UN treaty on competition. And right away... I can just hear everybody saying, well, the moment they say that, anyone says that, we're going to get the United States and the European Union and Australia and Canada and so on all saying, no, 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 no. We don't want the UN to get into this deal. Keep away from this deal. We're not going to allow, we're not going to participate in any kind of discussions around a UN treaty and competition. They actually have no choice in that decision. If a handful of countries or the global south in total comes together and says, we want a policy on competition, a UN treaty on competition, we're going to begin negotiations of establishing that treaty. There is absolutely no way that Europe and North America can be left out of that deal. They will insist on getting into it because they know it would mean the power shifting from them to decisions being made by the United Nations led by South governments. So they will join. The bad news in all of this, frankly, is that they will eventually join the negotiations. But negotiations will happen uh, because they can't stay away from those negotiations. The UN has all kinds of treaties where there's only a dozen countries in the UN treaty, or 40 or 50 or 100 sometimes out of the 195 members of the United Nations. So it's not unusual to make legally binding treaties with a minority even of the world's governments as part of those treaties. And they only apply to those countries. In the case of, of, of commerce and multinational corporations, that's all the difference in the world. Right. And can you speak to how could a competition policy change the, what kinds of considerations could it incorporate, for example, that would help it to address these problems that we're seeing with massive um, unregulated mergers? If you're a pesticide company, you can't buy seed companies. Right. You got to break up. Uh, if you're a farm machinery company, you can't control uh, big data sensors and satellites. If, um, if you have Big data information has got to be in the public domain, and it can only be in the public domain in a way it's, that it is understandable by farmers. Um, you, can, you can establish whatever rules you'd like to have. You can say that there can never be more than four companies. If you have four companies that have 40% of a given market at the national or subnational level, they've got to be broken up. You can force the breakup of uh, Bayer, which is now as Monsanto. You can force the breakup of, of Sinochem, which now has Syngenta. Uh, those things can be done through a competition policy. Um, the competition policy, most importantly now, really involves a discussion between the two companies that are proposing to merge with a regulator. Third parties are occasionally allowed to participate if, for example, they're a company that argues that it's going to be adversely affected by that merger. Then they often get a chance to have a say at least. But no one else does, or very rarely does anybody else have a chance. Uh, we could install into the UN treaty that uh, civil society can be third-party interveners, facilitated third-party interveners, so that our access to the information is the same and we could participate in the debate. We can also say that you can't just make the decision on the ultimate consumer price or the ultimate stakeholder value. You have to make the decision on a merger based upon environmental considerations, on uh, uh, other equity considerations, 
on um, the economic uh, value or all the economic strength of the companies or in countries that are involved. Uh, all kinds of uh, labor relations and so on can all be part of the negotiation of whether or not a, a merger would be allowed to go through. Right. And that would address the problem that we have now, which is that the antitrust legislators are only able to look at that very narrow very, very set narrow. of factors, but then they can't bring in the socioeconomic or environmental or... No, the environment has nothing to do with this. They don't care about the environment. I mean, they do. When you talk to them as individuals, they're kind of horrified at the situation that they're in, that they have to approve of things where the, you know, every part of their gut tells them this is a bad deal for society. So that can all be changed. It'll, I mean, I have to say that it'll take anywhere from seven to ten years to get a, a UN treaty on competition, but it's possible. And with that, by the way, either attached to that treaty or as a separate treaty, but uh, if it's separate, it should be simultaneous. We need a UN treaty on technology. Right. So we need something as well to address that ever-changing technological landscape. Absolutely. Everyone says, the over, including the OECD in its studies, that the overwhelming reason for mergers and acquisitions is, there, is the need to control technology platforms. So we need to be understanding in, in, in the world, in society, in our governments, we need to understand what's coming down the track. What are the new technologies? How are they going to impact us? What's good? What's bad? Do we need a green light, a red light, a yellow light uh, for these technologies before it's too late? And do we have a way of... of, of uh, Rewinding those technologies, retracting them, if if it turns out that the, the you know the the, uh, the advertising isn't as good as the reality, right? So a way to assess those technologies before they necessarily are put out into the field or into the the retail exactly. Landscape. And if but if they are out there and it turns out that that they were wrong about their safety or their value, then then they can be brought back again. They can be withdrawn. So all of that has to be there. It just is astonishing in a world where we're being told that everything changes all the time and, and never has changed faster, that we don't have a UN capacity to assess technologies. And that, to be honest, is absolutely deliberate. Uh, the UN was moving toward greater control over multinational corporations and, and their practices and greater control over technologies from the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. In, in the early 1990s, the U.S. government stepped in in the U.N. and said, we don't want you guys involved in this anymore. Stay out. And so the U.N. Center on Transnational Corporations was destroyed and got rid of in 1993. And the U.N. Center for Science and Technology for Development, which is looking at to tracking the technologies was disbanded in, also in 1993. So that was taken away from the UN. It was given literally a frontal lobotomy. So it couldn't function in those critical areas. And we need to build that back in a much stronger way than it was back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Wow. And can you, so we're talking, uh, of course, when we're talking about UN governance, we're talking about, as you said, a, quite a long journey of seven to 10 years or more <laughs> to, to see these as a reality. But can you give people a, an idea very briefly of the in the next year or so what are some of the key moments to pay attention to um where some of these ideas will be discussed or these things will begin to take shape a little bit sure i mean but also much more can happen much faster for either uh, legislation on competition or on technologies, they can happen at the national level mm. because we do have national national offices for technology to, or for uh, uh, constant, uh, competition policy. So no need to wait for the UN. It's quite reasonable for any of us to go to our governments and say, hey, you folks, there's going, another, there's going to be another round of mergers down the road. If you think it's bad now, wait till you see what's coming. We need to establish the, to change the rules of the game. Right, yeah. And as you said, the, the national level is so important with mergers that that's a very strategic place to, to go. And, and, and the nice thing about policymakers, or politicians at least, is, is that you don't lose votes by dumping on multinational corporations at election time. So it plays to the interests of many policymakers, especially if they're trying to get along with farmers, uh, as in the case of the Indian elections coming up, uh, where they, they, and in Brazil, where they might well accept that they need to change competition policy. It would be a rather popular political move by several political parties in different countries. So I, I wouldn't rule that out at all in the short term. Beyond that, there's a great deal more that can happen. Well, I mean, can I deal with it at both levels, first at the UN level and then at, at the home level, kind of, the national level? Um, at the UN level, we've got some immediate steps ahead of us. One of them is that uh, 
to its own amazement, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, held a remarkably successful conference in April of this year on agroecology. Uh, they thought they'd get very small attendance by a few sort of specialists and some quacks, as they might perceive it, uh, concerned about agroecology. And um, instead, they had um, 700 people crowding into the biggest room that FAO has available in Rome, crowded with governments, uh, crowded with uh, cabinet ministers from different countries all over the world and some leading scientists who uh, were saying agroecology is viable. It's a better system than the industrial food chain, and uh, it can feed the world now, and it can feed the world in 2050, and then the world in 2100 in a much more environmentally sound, sustainable, and equitable way. So FAO, reeling with delight over the success, mm -hmm. is now trying to sort out what they can do. And what it's going to do will play out uh, in the Committee on Agriculture that FAO holds every two years that sets its sort of plan for agriculture at the beginning of October. October 1 to 5, I think it is, in Rome. Uh, and and we need civil society to be there to talk about it and to, and to put pressure on national governments that are in that room to encourage FAO to uh, identify more human resources and, and broader funding to move ahead with, with their agroecology agenda and give more support to national and regional initiatives around agroecology around the world. Immediately after that meeting, October um, starts October, I think, 15th to 19th, is a meeting in, in, again in Rome. It's the, it's the UN Committee on World Food Security. That's a committee that has, for the last uh, two and a half years, been fighting about um, mega-mergers in the food system. They've been very concerned about it. Um, big governments have blocked most countries from being able to talk about it in the way they want to or taking the steps that they want to. Now that these mergers are complete and we can begin to see the shape of the next round of mergers, I think there's momentum enough in, in the UN to say, no, no, let's, let's bring this on the table in a very clear, tough way, look at the structure of the entire food system, and maybe even propose negotiations begin on a competition policy. And that could come out of the, the uh, Committee on Food Security for the UN uh, literally this October. Beyond that, we've got uh, quite a critical meeting that's taking place in Egypt in November, um, middle of November for two weeks, which um, is the, the Convention on Biological Diversity. It meets every two years. Um, it's a tough fighting ground to deal with the new technologies, not all of them, but to deal with the digital DNA technologies, synthetic biology, gene editing. These issues are front and center in the debate in the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, civil society and many governments are pushing toward a moratorium on the release of, of genetically uh, edited materials in the field and are trying to get that agreed to at the UN as a moratorium. And, and there's a really good chance, frankly, that they'll get that. And if not that, at least get agreement that the UN should, should begin to discuss, again, a treaty on technology assessment. So these are, these are immediate steps in the next few months even, where, where I think the momentum is such uh, that, uh, that we, we could get somewhere and where, again, the, the disarray of agribusiness, of the industrial food chain is so great that they haven't got their act together. Mm -hmm. Then I guess the other part uh, that you raise is, is the um, national level activities there as well. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, I'm amazed by the kinds of discussions that I've been in, whether it's in Germany or in Brussels at the EU level or in Canada with Food Secure Canada, where people are talking about the need for national food policies. Right. And it's true in the UK, it's true in Sweden, in Norway. People are saying that, and these just just the industrialized countries that I've been in recently, are, are saying that our country doesn't have a food policy. We may have a farm policy, but not a food policy. We need to have a broader sort of food sovereignty policy that lets us really discuss where we want to go in the food system. And we need to have a national food council as well, which is made up of, of all of us who eat food, who can, can help to monitor those policies to make sure they're done right. And they have to be entrenched in in government legislation. And that is well underway in in Canada, certainly where I live, it's also, in, and you live, also underway in the European Union. And I think that that kind of model of establishing policy should be uh, pushed in every country around the world, wherever it's remotely possible to do so. And again, it's, to, it's taking advantage of, of the 
current confusion in the food system, in the, in, in the agribusiness system, where they can't get a consensus among themselves as to where they're going. So as they wander around trying to figure out what's happening to themselves, we should be pushing for national food policies. Yeah, taking advantage of that of that mayhem that you were talking about earlier. Exactly. Yeah, that is a very hopeful scene to to situate ourselves in as civil society, to think about how we can take advantage of that and how we can try to move forward some of these mechanisms to, to keep the ever-growing industrial food chain kind of in, in check and, and, in, and kind of serving our, our interests in a way. Um, Pat, before we conclude, do you have any last thoughts or last words for people who are concerned about these issues and looking for ways forward? Well, oh, they should be optimistic. Um, we have never been better positioned to make bigger changes. Uh, at the um, World Economic Forum in, in January this year, the Prime Minister of Canada uh, made a speech where he said that um, the world has never changed so fast and it will never change this slowly again. Um, well, uh, yes, it is changing, but in that we've never had a better opportunity to make the changes we want to make than now, and we may never get a better chance than this time. So I, I'm optimistic that we can make changes. The movement is clearly there. The trend line of, of, of concern about our food system, whether it's in Africa or Asia or Latin America or, or in Canada, is, is there. And, and um, the target has never been clearer in terms of where the problem lies and what has to be done about it, the capacity of peasants to produce food that will feed the rest of us and, and all of us to, to co collaborate. I remember back when we were in the center group, we first started to work on these issues. Um, the biggest company that was threatening seeds and pesticides was Royal Dutch Shell, which had, for a brief time became the largest uh, seed company on the planet by far. And we used to say, and everyone else was saying, that the uh, that uh, whatever culture you're in, there, there's these prayers that people have, like in the Christian uh, religion, there's, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. oh, give us this day our daily bread shouldn't be a prayer to Royal Dutch Shell. Huh. And, and it today shouldn't be a prayer to Black Rock or Black Stone right. or to uh, Sino Kim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to reclaim the framing of food as something that belongs to the people and, and is produced by people for people instead of this corporate-driven, people-less vision that we're seeing move forward today. I think that's very powerful. Well, thank you so much for, for speaking with me today. Um, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more, more from, from you and from ETC soon about this shifting landscape of the food system. Yep. Thanks very much.